Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. And I'm Maria Kishan. In our show this week, we'll take a look at the Honolulu Marathon and how it's been changed by new technology. 31,000 runners ran and walked the course on December 9th, and all were being tracked by RFID chips. There's a new tech being developed for marathons here and around the world. A few years ago, they learned to time the runners and keep a database on everyone, but that wasn't the end of it. Marathons are everywhere these days, and every marathon wants to be at the cutting edge. So the result is that these timing and database technologies have gotten better and better over the past few years and are being deployed in marathons around the world, including the Honolulu Marathon, which at 31,000 entries is the biggest of all. Good for us! As everyone knows, the Honolulu Marathon took place on Sunday, December 9th. On Saturday, the day before the race, we went to race headquarters at the convention center and talked with Frederick Birenval and Steve Foster, both of whom are old pros at marathon technology and heavily involved in the technology used at the Honolulu Marathon. From a technology point of view, we use all of the open platforms, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram now, which is a, a company owned by Facebook, as you know. And uh, we use, and Pinterest, we, we, the, list, the list goes on, because we use a lot of images. We get a lot of images, and it's all about showing Hawaii, showing the runners in a, in a light that they will enjoy seeing themselves, and things that they like to share. Because the social media, as you know, is all about sharing. And sharing experiences, sharing thoughts, anxieties. A lot of anxiety before a race. Sure. And what we do, I think, is we facilitate the, for the runners to be able to talk to each other through the social media. And they can get advice from each other and from us, of course, but m m most importantly from each other. And they can talk about what worries them, what scares them, what excites them all the different emotions that are involved in running. And it's, it's an interest that everyone, is, everyone has. So it's, it, it actually it's work, works out very well for us. Misery loves company. It, it, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and so does, so does pleasure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the community creating mm -hmm. all of this uh, interaction before the race or during the race? Well, that's interesting because it's, of course, mostly uh, before and after the race. But with Twitter, and even Facebook, you have a lot of people now running with the smartphones because smartphones are getting smaller and people are wanting to run with them. And then they can take pictures and they can tweet. So what we have is we've, we have a hashtag mm -hmm. that we ask people to use when they're, when they're tweeting. So we've, this year we started to use a hashtag called Run Paradise, which I think is quite nice. We're also going to have a hashtag called HM Shoutout. Now, the HM Shoutout is one that we'll be following at the radio broadcast. And Dan Cook, our radio presenter, he'll be reading out the tweets <laughs> and the Facebook updates from people around the world. Because this is an international race, and people come from all over the world. And he'll be getting messages from Minnesota, Canada, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, and be saying, give us a shout out for, for our uh, father, or our mother, or our son, or <laughs> daughter who's running the race. This is really exciting. It is. Because it is a community, but this connects the community, so it's yeah. much more than the loneliness of the long-distance runner. Well, exactly. Those days are long gone. You know, you can be, unless, unless you're one of the top guys and you're at the front, you're not so lonely. When I cross the finish, you're going to know who I am immediately, right? Immediately. How, how do you know that? Well, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a list. There's a, there's every, every runner has a chip in his, on his shoe. So that chip... As you cross certain map points along the way, it sends a signal up to the to the uh, to the to the uh, to the EPR, and uh, and uh, we we log your split times. So we know how fast you run your first 10k, how fast you run your first half map or the first half map half of the map, and 30k. So we can we can track you the whole way. Oh, that's great. So give us the stats on this race. How many? How many uh, runners do you expect? Well, this, this, uh, this is a bumper year, actually. It's mm. the, uh, the largest field since uh, 1997. And we're looking at, uh, right, as of right now, with about three hours to go till we close registration, we're about 31,000 wow. registered runners. Now, of course, not everyone will run, as uh, every, every, every race has a, has a drop-off. People are sick or haven't trained enough. They think it's too hot. So, uh, and also we started the registration process 
uh, quite a long time ago, about in, in uh, even at, towards the de end of December last year, and uh, people don't even remember they they signed up. <laughs> they, you, so they forget. <laughs> they forget. But we're hoping we're hoping that we're, I, we have a little uh, we have a little competition on how many runners will finish. But I'm guessing around 27, 28,000, oh, wow. which is which is it's great. Ninety percent. And uh, but it's fantastic for the uh, for the uh, local economy, of course. How does it break down? Uh, you know by Local versus uh, Europe versus Asia. It's it's it's, it's uh, okay. This, the Japanese are the predominant visitors from overseas. They they come in at about 55 to 60 percent of the total runners. The uh, number of runners from Hawaii this year is very high. Uh, we have 13, 14,000, 13,000 from from Hawaii. That is. Which is, which is a large number yes. uh, for a small place. And then, obviously, California, Washington, Oregon, account, and, and Canada is a, is a large contributor of people. From Europe, it's less, so we try to, uh, to, to attract people to come. But it's, of course, it is a long way, we have to remember that, to come for We've had some extraordinary African runners over the years. All the elites, yeah. pretty much, yeah. are uh, from a few small towns very close to each other in Western Kenya and Ethiopia. It must be the water. It must be, there must be something <laughs> in the air there that, that they're doing, doing right. And they have, a, they have a tradition of running and also of training very, very hard. Mm -hmm. They train very hard. So what's, what's the demographic? Old, young, how does it break the down? Average, the average age is about 41 years old. Now what about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the range of, of finish? You expect that the top runners will be coming in what, just the, short of two hours? No, not short of two hours, because that would be a world record, and uh, yeah, well, we, why not? We would be overjoyed <laughs> if that happened, but uh, it's not a, it's not a world record uh, breaking course. Uh, okay. It's quite hilly and uh, it's it's quite hot as well. Okay. But uh, we generally the course record is two hours and is it uh, eleven minutes? And we believe that could be broken tomorrow. Ah. So by the time you air this, of course, you'll know. Yes. Uh, yes. But if they come in just just uh, about two hours and ten minutes, it's uh, it's a good estimate. So and how about the far limit? How long do you give them to finish? We're unique. We're the only race, marathon race, in the world that lets everybody finish. Most races cut off uh, the, the the race after about six hours. We leave the roads open. We leave our timing mats on the course and the finish line open until the last person has crossed. Normally it takes about 14 hours. Yeah. So Frederick, what time are you going to get up in the morning? I think, I'm not sure I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any point? Probably not. Probably not. No, I'll be, I'll be getting up at about two in the morning. I'll be down at, we, we move our media tent down to the park at uh, about four, three, four in the morning. So uh, we'll be there waiting for the start and we'll be then running our social media activities from that press tent. And we'll actually have people tweeting out on the course as well on behalf of the marathon. And we're gonna, what we're going to do, which is quite exciting, we're going to be following the elite athletes as almost as they get out of bed at their hotel Great. into the VIP tr uh, buses that they ride to yeah. the start. Yeah. And we'll be photographing them and tweeting and asking them to, uh, to let everyone everyone else who's, who's listening in on the social media, let them know how they feel and stuff. Because it's, it's, we want to humanize the, uh, the, the elite runners who are otherwise quite anonymous. You're doing the timing then tomorrow? Yes, yes we are. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we have 30,000 plus computer chips out on the course. And uh, we the timing locations, we've got timing locations all throughout the course. And every time somebody crosses, we get a time and we know where they are when they're, they cross. Uh, it's a, a lot of equipment, a lot of uh, technology, and it's all done uh, you know, through the internet. Well, through the internet. It's so all done through the internet. When you say uh, chips, I, I think of RFID. Am I right? Uh, RFID. If you take a look, this is this is what like what, one of the chips. It's the green thing. It's the green thing. And that's the, it, it is an RFID chip. Okay. It, it is an RFID chip with uh, that's powered once it goes across the mat itself, and then it uh, it sends its information into the, the the actual timing maps that they run across, and then we pull that information out, and it goes into uh, to our systems. Uh, and then the person's data is actually attached to that unique chip, so we know every time the person crosses uh, 
every location on the course. So you tailor the chip, you stamp the chip, as it were? This is a unique chip. This one has a number of 1TKA4ZA, and that's the only one. And that's all I need, and then I take and I marry that to the database. I marry this to the database, just like they have a race number. I marry the chip number to that race number. And then when the chip goes across, then it goes into our system and it automatically populates the person's database with the information and with the number of times. As soon as we get the results, that we take and in turn bounce that information right back to a website, which is only about a two to three second delay to where a person can, we can tell a person when they cross the map within a second or two, and actually it's posted to the internet that quickly. Wow. So I will know within yes. two or three seconds the status of my, yes. the runners that I am following. Yes. Yes. It'll all be there. It'll all be there. Search and find their names yeah, you, and what have you. Yeah, you can go to the website and you can say your wife is running. You select her race number and watch me, and you can have a watch me list of just the runners you want to watch. And um, as they, they they go across, it populates. Oh, that's It'll populate great. just your watch me list, or you can do a, a master search through the whole database, or you can watch just the elites. Uh, but it's your choice. And I can do this from Bolivia if I so you choose. Can, anybody in the world can do it. Uh, tom tomorrow uh, you'll, you'll see probably, you know, 100,000 plus hits uh, in the first uh, hour of the race or so. Armed with the knowledge we had obtained from Frederick and Steve, we got up early on the day of the race and went down to the finish line in Capiolani Park. It was quite an experience to be there along with press from around the world. We waited for the lead runners and saw them come in just after 7 o'clock a.m. What a thrill for us and for them. There's some serious runners in here. You can see some airline tags. Actually, everybody has a Japanese airline tag. Not a lot of group runners or novelty runners where they run together and make fun. Most of these runners are single runners. Some of them are already walking. Fantastic. And this is only the beginning. They haven't gotten very far in yet. But it must be a thrill to come down Kalakaua Avenue with all the people around, everybody watching them as the sun rises over Waikiki. It's a great magnet. See the lights down the other side of the island now. The trick is to go as light as you can, though. So we're going to walk down to the uh, press tent now and see what's going on. Cleaning it off, sweeping it off getting ready for the, the first runners. They're all in place. Shane, talk, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot here, do you have mile splits for them in the last uh, couple of miles? Do you know how? I'm like a couple of miles away. Handicapped runner. Fantastic. Fantastic. Covering the Honolulu Marathon once again. Second time to cover cover the event. Right, with your magic cell phone. Too. Yeah, exactly. Me and my magic cell phone, uh, sports director Chris Tanaka, and uh, he was also doing some photography, and um, Peter Tang, who's uh, another one of our video journalists, and he's up on the bridge, so we've got this covered all over the place. Hawaiian Electric Company, of course. <laughs> all right, here he comes. Easy, easy. Right across the line. <laughs> I know if I had his build, I could do that too. <laughs>
That's a big thing. <laughs> oh, they're great. <laughs> Looks like he's had a hard race. Well, I think a lot of people here used to run, you know, now they're official. Yeah. <laughs> so for you for coming down, you probably get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Jay, that's, uh, that's normal, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's not doing all that well. Just a given time for the race and for the city. Yolani, Polymonium, Strap. Thanks, you guys. That's wonderful. <laughs> After a while, we walked around to try to get a hand on what was going on among the crowds there, both the crowd of runners but also the crowd of bystanders. The Honolulu Marathon is a great celebration for running, for the runners, for the tourists, and for Hawaii in general. We are so lucky to have started our marathon some 40 years ago. Even after all this time, it suits us well. There were so many volunteers there, you could tell that this was far more than a sports and media event. It was a community event where local people turned out in droves just to be close to the runners and the thrill of the biggest race in the world, the Honolulu Marathon, still going strong after all these years. The roads are blocked in town all the way to Hawaii Kai and back to the finish in Waikiki. People line the streets and cheer them on. Some people had the inconvenience of not being able to get where they wanted to go that Sunday, but everyone was understanding and supportive. After all, the marathon is good for us, all of us, and it's an event that raises all boats in Hawaii. The crowds came out and there was festival in the air, just the way we want it to be. Families were spending their Sunday together, enjoying their children and friends in the high energy of this high profile event. Spirits were high. We kept on thinking that this is the kind of event and community phenomenon that brings people together from around our island and state. This is what we're really good at doing, hosting visitors and athletes from far away who love Hawaii, showing them the people's aloha. Beyond that, the marathon is an investment. It's an investment of time and effort by the race organizers, the sponsors, the runners, the volunteers, the hotels, and the police and medical professionals who work together to watch over them. It's an investment that is paid and will pay great dividends for our state. This is good business for everyone, and it's what makes Hawaii special as a destination resort. We're so glad we were there. We think everyone in Hawaii should share in the excitement of our marathon. It's a great way to spend a lovely Sunday morning and a great way to feel good about our state. If you didn't go last weekend, you might want to participate in the new Hapalua Half Marathon next spring and of course the next marathon next December. We all owe it to ourselves to be there.
And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. Drive Time Radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week. Tune into 760 AM for great shows every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Raise your awareness on tech, energy, Asia, and more on ThinkTech Radio. On January 24th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present the annual Entrepreneur of the Year and the Deal of the Year awards at a luncheon program at the Plaza Club. Sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. Well, Jay, I thought we'd talk this week about one of my favorite subjects, which is the challenge uh, our educational system faces compared to the rest of the world. And just this week, the Wall Street Journal reported uh, about a study uh, that's being conducted routinely now that uh, compares uh, fourth and eighth graders f from around the globe in 33 countries in math and science. And as you might expect, uh, we're not doing so well. Uh, in, a, in particular, in math, fourth graders um, were outpaced by um, Singaporeans, 43% to 13 percent, that is to say in terms of how many are in the top rankings. Eighth graders it was even worse. Compared to Korean students, 47 percent were in the highest rank, uh, 7 percent of U.S. students. Um, and that's in the math area. Science is uh, also pretty drear. Again, fourth graders uh, uh, outpaced by Singaporeans, 33 percent to 15 percent among U.S. students. And eighth graders, 40 percent to 10 percent. Interestingly enough, the fourth graders were actually doing better compared to their global peers than the eighth graders, which says that, you know, they're losing it's a between worse. the fourth grade and the eighth grade. <laughs> right. So, you know, again, it, it gets back to this whole uh, need to really re emphasize uh, math and science education, to motivate teachers, to pay them well. I was at a party last weekend where. Uh, a newly minted uh, chemistry teacher um, was among the attendees, and we were talking about it. And uh, you know, she was saying that it was really hard to get the kids interested in in uh, science. And I, I I don't know why, other than the fact there must be so many distractions that uh, our parents are so lax that they don't really push their kids. But we need to do something about it. Yeah. Well. I don't know if the teachers all by themselves can generate the enthusiasm that you'd like to see. I think the community has to generate that and the parents have to generate that. And if they are intimidated by science and technology and math, um, then the kids are, the kids are not going to be as excited as they could be. I think we collectively have to excite those kids. Everyone has to excite those kids. It should ripple through our whole society as it is rippling through the China society. And that's the way kids will be excited, uh, and that's the way they will do well in school in those subjects. I think there needs to be some, some discipline. Uh, certainly role models are not, uh, as we talked about last week, you know, our, our heroes are not uh, math and science geniuses. They're football and baseball players. Generally, there needs to be more discipline and more focus. And I, I dare say that in China or Japan and Korea and Singapore, that uh, they demand a lot of those kids, no doubt, and really push them. And it's got to be just the, in the educational system itself. Yes, and, and they, have, it, they have to be told that if they want to succeed in life, they have to do well in these subjects. That, that happens in China and Japan and Korea. They have to take tests and do well, or they will be behind the curve in their lives to follow. We have to communicate the same message. We have to demand the same attention. Uh, we can't take any wooden nickels on this. If, they, if they're distracted, as you say, if they're not focused on this, in the 21st century, they are going to pay a big price, and so are we. I also don't think that uh, they have as much opportunity there to go on to higher education. I think the ratio of uh, available seats in higher education in many of these uh, countries is probably lower than the U.S., and so they have to fight harder if they want to uh, succeed and get in. Yeah, there's a competition for sure. And uh, a lot of them really struggle to continue their education. That's one thing I noticed on one of my trips to China. I noticed that 
um, people, not just kids, are interested in lifelong education. They keep going back to school. They save their money, they go back, then they work again, then they go back. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a, a lifelong cycle of education. We have to inculcate it, that into our population, and we have to make sure that science and technology are right at the top of it. And if we don't do that, as I said before, we will pay a, a dear price. Well, that's why we need to get f folks to think tech. And don't forget the heroes, Bill. We have to get math heroes, science heroes. We have to connect those kids with those heroes so they can see the path. I agree. Thank you, Bill. Aloha. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation, which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the Gas Company, a proponent of the Liquefied Natural Gas Initiative, building a better energy future for Hawaii. Okay, Maria, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Maria does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com, be a sponsor or a volunteer, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Mm -hmm.